And good evening. Great to see you today. Great to have you join us for the Bible study. I guess you see me. I'm not seeing you, but great to have you join us for the Bible study. Thanks for tuning in. Trust it's a blessing to you. Trust you've had a good week so far. We're halfway through it. A lot of things going on, a lot of moving parts. Looking forward to another great day on Sunday. We'll say a word about that just a little bit later. But we're glad to have you join us for our midweek Bible study. You're going to be getting your Bibles. We'll be looking in Proverbs 16 in just a few moments for our Bible study. But while you're doing that, our missionaries of the week are the Ojos out of our church. Some of our missionaries, Timothy and Ronke Ojo in Nigeria. There's a picture of them. And uh, just for those that sometimes just to kind of keep you a little uh, polished up on your geography, thought we'd kind of show you where they serve and kind of help you to place it in Africa. Uh, you'll see a larger, this is a continent, shows most of the continent of Africa. And you can see the red circle right there, kind of in the bend where Western Africa turns uh, and the coastline turns south. That's Nigeria right there. Now, if you zoom on in a little bit, you'll see the country of Nigeria a little closer on your screen. And then now you see a circle with a star. That is where the Ojos minister. That's the area where they are. And uh, so you can see that there. Do be praying for them and the work there of Faith Baptist Church. And I know that they would appreciate appreciate that because it's uh, Nigeria and that we have a little missionary trivia for you tonight and so feel free to uh, text in your response here's your trivia word the coastal city of Lagos was the former capital of Nigeria because of its dense population it has been called Africa's big blank what is the blank there? Africa's big blank. See if you can come up with that answer and uh, text it to me. We'll see how you do on that little bit of trivia. Uh, prayer request wise, uh, do take note of the names that we have on the prayer list. Uh, Miss Ruth Delzell has got some uh, treatments and things coming up. Uh, be praying for her. Uh, you've got Deborah Dunn also at a doctor's appointment this week. Let, uh, and uh, maybe look at what uh, kind of set up a schedule for what they're going to do with some radiation for her. Ray Hudgens, you see there. Ruth Colwick. Charles Overby, that's some of um, Brother Jerry's uh, family. That's his, I think, brother. And then Eddie Rogers. Eddie got moved uh, last week, got moved to Life Care of East Ridge. Pray for him as he is now, uh, he's taking another, that step to Life Care of East Ridge. Looking forward to getting the next step home. And then, of course, you see Brother Arlen Smith there. Did get a good report on some tests as far as uh, some of the tests that they did on him. But do be praying for him in the days ahead. I know that he would appreciate it. Those are our names from our church family. And, of course, the Ojos as our missionaries of the week. Let's be sure and pray for them. Let's open in a word of prayer tonight. Father, we love you and we thank you for the opportunity to join together. We do pray you'll bless our time. Lord, we have these in our church family that we have that we lift up before you with uh, needs. A number of them are dealing with areas of cancer. Some of them are dealing with recovery from uh, events that have happened. I do pray that you would just touch their bodies, give healing and strength, give doctors wisdom, Give, uh, give a special energy and stamina to the family members and help them as they tend to them and, and in many cases try to both care on their responsibilities as well as checking in or caring for family members. And Lord, we'll thank you for what you do. We do pray for the Ojos this week as our missionaries of the week and ask that you would bless their work there in Nigeria, give them fruit for their labor. Uh, bless the work of both the orphanage and the church and all the things that are going on as Brother Timothy uh, works, uh, keep him safe, give him strength, keep him well, and help him as he leads the ministry. We'll thank you for what you do. Lord, we also pray for our time tonight as we look into your word and ask that you would uh, give us uh, insight from your word that we might live more like Christ. We'll thank you for that. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Thanks for joining us tonight. Let me just mention a couple of announcements. Uh, May has been family month. Boy, it's been so much fun. It's been a great month for us. Good times of both services as well as fellowship and some activities together as a church. Had a great uh, weekend last weekend. Thank you for those that came up to the house for a time of fellowship afterwards. Uh, after this afternoon service, we enjoyed having you up. Trust you had a good time. And so, uh, uh, but we continue through the month. Don't forget, this coming Sunday, Sunday morning is graduate recognition. So we'll be recognizing our graduates from kindergarten, high school, and college, and uh, making a special time to recognize them. And then Sunday evening, along with the service, we'll be doing a family talent night. And so we're looking forward to a great time there. I know we have, oh, six or seven that have signed up to uh, do some type talent. Listen, if you haven't done so, I want you to make plans do something if you can if you have any maybe a unique skill even why don't you plan on doing that and uh, come and we'll share it share some time together I know some of them will be instrumental some will be uh, I, I look at all of them I don't know what all of them are I don't know what everybody the different ones are going to do uh, but we want you to plan on being a part that'll be Sunday night Sunday afternoon our five o'clock service then the following Sunday the last Sunday of May is of course Memorial Day weekend our emphasis on Sunday morning will be leaving a godly legacy and then we'll conclude our month with our church-wide cookout here Sunday afternoon and we'll look forward to that so I want you to make plans May's been a good month we've enjoyed it we trust it's been a blessing and been helpful to you and continue to be faithful. Let me just commend you as you continue seeing more and more, making it the way back out and in the services. Let me encourage you, be in your place, uh, be here for the services, and let's be faithful. And uh, we'll uh, enjoy that time. Hope you had a chance to find Proverbs chapter 16 in your Bible. For those of you that were in the men's Bible study on Sunday morning, you're going to see that this is going to kind of parallel some of the things I talked with you about uh, when we were talking even this past uh, this past Sunday and some of the things that I gave you to take with you we're going to kind of use some of that tonight for the other part of the church for them to follow and kind of a little bit of a challenge about it I from time to time this comes back up through some situation I think many times we are living in a day when people no longer see how that the scripture the word of God is relevant to everyday life and because of that they're not invested in the reading of it, the studying of it, and the obedience of it because they just don't feel that it relates. Sometimes they might be familiar with the story of, of how that God saved Noah and his family from the, from the flood, but they don't see how that relates to today. They might be familiar with the walls of Jericho that tumbled down, but they don't understand how that, how that is relevant. But I, wanted to, I, I challenged the class and we talked through the fact of there are a lot of principles in the scripture and especially in the book of Proverbs you'll also find them in Psalms you find them in the New Testament there are principles that can help you in decisions and everyday matters that you have to deal with if we'll take time to look at God's word and glean from it those truths then it begins to take that relevance when we see how it how it uh impacts our lives I was telling them last week I had a conversation with a with a preacher and in the process of the conversation he's asking about someone we were chatting there were a couple different principles from Proverbs that came to my mind that I mentioned in my conversation with him and it seemed to be insightful in doing that just yesterday I was on the phone with a with another preacher and we were talking some and and he kind of called to ask a little bit of advice and even as I was sharing it with him my mind was taken back to Proverbs as we were talking about some things and I was reminded of the verse in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths a lot of principles a lot of truths that we can find I gave the men uh, a little half sheet we use for a study guide front and back and I challenged them to take some of these verses and read them kind of put them into their own words maybe a statement of principle uh, a paraphrase of that verse that will help them and then see how it may come up in a real life situation uh, I've shared before several years ago I was working with a, a man a husband and wife and they had come to me and as we were trying to work through some things I challenged him about getting into God's word and reading and I told him read the 
chapter in Proverbs that corresponds to the day of the week. And he had a situation that came up where he had, and he had called me to say he and his wife, had, they had, we ended, well, we ended up seeing it to the ball field. He said he and his wife had had a clash that day. And I said, did you have your devotions today? And he did. I said, did you do what it says in verse 1 of Proverbs chapter 15? A soft answer turneth away wrath. He was again instantly reminded there are principles in God's word that come into everyday real life situations. I want to give you a few tonight and then after we do that I'm going to give you kind of a little conclusion some things I'm going to challenge you to make a commitment to through the remainder of this week. I gave the men some from chapter 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 through the book. I'm going to go back to chapter 16 because that would have been last Sunday and we're going to look at those tonight in the time that we have. In some cases we'll just look at one part of a verse other times it will be the whole verse but if you found Proverbs Proverbs chapter 16 the first word on first verse I want you to look at I want you to look at the a part of verse 6 the a part Proverbs 16 a notice what it says here's what it says <clears throat> by mercy and truth iniquity is purged by mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. Now, notice the word iniquity. So let's, let's, let's look at this phrase. Iniquity has to do with sin or wrong. Uh, several months back, we kind of had the, the lessons where we dealt with sin and transgressions and iniquity. And we used some, uh, some video to kind of help in the teaching of that. So in iniquity, we're talking about wrong. We're talking about sin, that type thing. The purging has to do with the cleansing or the washing it away, the cleaning it up. So how is, how is sin to be cleansed? When we have to deal with it, how is it cleansed? He gives two things here, by mercy and truth, okay? Mercy and truth. So you might, you might word a principle something like this. Sin slash or wrong must be dealt with compassionately, and truthfully okay now, now look at that statement sin we think of sin in, in church and we, we, we think of in, 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 our, in our Christian context we think of sin but it can also be that which is dealt with in, in a, some other wrong that may not just be in a church setting it may be in a, in a real world real life everyday scenario where you have to deal with wrong how do you deal with it what does the Bible say about when you deal with it where in this verse it says when you're trying to deal with it and clean up a situation, it is important that you do it with mercy and truth. It takes both for a situation to be resolved. So when you have to deal with it in a real life situation, you want to show compassionate, you want to show a compassionate heart while still showing a commitment to truth. So how does that work? Let's suppose in a real life situation, maybe you have to deal with something with your children. Maybe you're in a job situation, you have to deal with something with a, with a fellow worker or if you're in a supervisory situation, you have to deal with, some, with someone that answers to you at work. How do you deal with it when something has to be dealt with and you're gonna, you wanna try to bring out the best in that scenario? How does compassionate heart and truthfulness work? Well, number one, I think the first thing I see in this when you when I, when you have a situation, uh, let's suppose that uh, in a real let's take a real life situation. Uh, you've got someone at work, and because of your role in leadership, you have to call that person in and deal with something that they've done wrong. Maybe it's something. Maybe it's an an error in a way. Maybe even it's an intentional thing that they've done some way. When you bring them in, the first thing you may do is make sure and verbalize the fact that you, your appreciation for them, your compassion for them, that you want what's best, you want to be a help to them. So you verbalize that. Then you deal with the facts of the situation. Truthfulness involves the reality of what happened. It's not sweeping it up, on the, up under the rug, but it's also not going outside the bounds of what the facts, the truth is about the situation so you deal with the facts and then when you finish you come up with a plan for how it's going to be resolved you reassure them hey listen you got their best interest at heart you want to be a help to them and you finish it up 
By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. A person who is only tied to truth but has no mercy about them can be very abrasive. A person who is only tied to mercy but doesn't anchor themselves to truth, they're going to struggle with dealing and, and without not overlooking what needs to be dealt with and to help resolve the situation. It's just like what well, I've told you before. The Bible says of Jesus, he was full of grace and truth. You see that when he dealt with a woman taken in adultery. So mercy, by mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. Can I challenge you, when you have to deal with a real life situation, always approach it from a compassion of heart, but a commitment to right. That's what you have to do. That's a great teaching verse. That's a great verse to live by. It can help you in your everyday life. Staying right here in Proverbs 16, look at the first part of verse 20. Proverbs 16 and verse 20. It says this, He that handleth a matter wisely shall find good. The verse goes on to say, And whoso trusteth in the Lord, happy is he. Look at the first part of that phrase. This, again, is a, is a reminder to us. He that handleth a matter wisely shall find good. Notice that word, wisely. We need wisdom. The handling of a situation, the handling of a matter, handling it wisely allows you to bring the most good of it from that situation. I put this statement. Here's a statement you might put to go with this verse. By dealing with situations wisely, I can bring good even out of difficult circumstances. By dealing with situations wisely, I can bring good even out of difficult circumstances. Knowing that, where am I going to get wisdom? If any man lack wisdom, let him what? Ask of God. You know, this principle would lead me before I deal with the situation to make it matter, a matter of prayer, a matter of meditation, to seek God's face, to give me the opportunity to, to um, know how to deal with the situation in the way. Wisdom is, is knowing, a lot of times it's knowing what is needed, knowing and being, sometimes it's saying what is needed, not necessarily what is wanted. But being able to say it in a way of wisdom. Maybe sometimes it's bringing a right person into a situation to help in the resolution of it. He that handleth a matter wisely shall find good. Well, that's a great comfort, isn't it? So what do we need? We need wisdom when we handle those situations. So you come to a situation that you have to deal with in, in life. And you come to this, and it's a difficult situation. And so what do you do? You pray, you ask God to help you, you seek wisdom. You might even seek counsel. And then as you begin to deal with that situation, you try to deal with it in wisdom so that you can bring the best possible scenario out of that circumstance. That's a great reminder. He that handleth the matter wisely shall find good. That's another good reminder. Maybe there's a situation that you're having to deal with, a situation, whether it's a situation in work where you need the patience to wait. Maybe it's a situation in, in a family where you need to know how to deal with the circumstance, how to deal with the situation. Ask God, because if you deal with it wisely, he that handleth the matter wisely shall find God. Good. When I begin to look at that verse and apply it to my life, it causes me to be a person that I will, I will take time for prayer before I go in to tackle a situation, if at all possible. Hey, by the way, isn't that what Nehemiah did? Remember back at the beginning of Nehemiah? He ends up in the king's presence in chapter 2. The king notices something about his countenance. He knows he's burdened, and he asks him about it. And Nehemiah says that he prayed to the Lord, and he answered the king. By the way, he answered the king very wisely. I pointed this out when we were, when I was preaching through the book. <clears throat> when Nehemiah spoke to the king, he used wise words. In that section, he never says Jerusalem. 
why would he not have said Jerusalem? Maybe it was out of wisdom. You see, on three different occasions, the Babylonian Empire had to go and attack Jerusalem because of their rebellion. They conquered the city the first time in 606. They carried away captives. The city rebelled and reinforced itself. They came back again in 597, had to besiege the city again and take captives. Then a third time, the city rebelled, and in 586, they came back, and they not only took captives, they destroyed the city. The city of Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem had been a city of frustration for the kings of Babylon. <laughs> I saw that was coming. I couldn't get it, get the mic close. The city of Jerusalem. So what did, you, what did Nehemiah say? Here's what he said. King, why shouldn't my heart be sad when the city of my forefathers lieth in waste? He used wise words in that situation. And he let him know. Understanding kings very often were very sensitive to their, to their ancestors, to the place of their birth, to the place of their death. In honoring those, and Nehemiah says, Hey, king, the reason I'm really, the reason I'm burdened is because of the city of my forefathers, city of my fathers, my forefathers, lieth in disgrace. What did the king do? Tell me what you need, Nehemiah. Well, I need permission to go. I need letters to help me to clear through the lands between here and there and not be bothered. And I need supplies. And you know what the king did? The king gave him everything that he needed. you know why? Because Nehemiah handled the matter wisely. And he found good. A lot of things can happen in life. There's another verse that you find in verse 27. Now, verses 27 and 28 really kind of go together, but we'll look at each of them. The A part of Proverbs 16, 27 says this, uh, an ungodly man diggeth up evil. Now, now, now listen to this verse. An ungodly man diggeth up evil. What kind of man digs up evil? An ungodly man. I was looking at this passage and what some different ones said about it. And one of the things that you kind of come to on it is ungodly people love to bring up the bad ungodly people love to tell the bad you know we live in a day it seems like the thing that drives the news cycle is being able to give bad news tragedy heartbreak uh, difficulty that seems to be what drives the news cycle sometimes we can have that happen on our own where we're, we're People, they're all too eager to tell about something bad that's happened to someone else or something bad that someone else has done. You know what kind of people do that? That's what this verse says, ungodly people. Boy, that hits kind of close to home, doesn't it? They live for the bad news, and they love to share it with others. They want to be the first one to share the, the, the tragedy. Now look at the very next verse because we're going to kind of put these two together. In verse 28, he goes on to say this. A froward man soweth strife, and a whisperer separateth chief friends. A froward man separateth, uh, soweth strife, and a whisperer separateth chief friends. Now the first thing you need to know what that word froward means. The word froward, froward actually means uh, perverse, a gossip. It was interesting when I looked it up in the dictionary, it actually says willfully contrary. You ever, boy, we don't use that word a lot. You ever known someone just said, boy, that guy is just contrary. You used to hear that a lot, don't hear it anymore. The word froward is a person who is perverse, they're a gossip, or they're a willfully contrary individual. Okay, that type of man, you know what he does? He sows strife. He sows strife. The second part of the verse is this, a whisperer separateth chief friends. Now, what does that mean, a whisperer? You know, the guy would say, hey, listen, don't tell anybody I told you, but did you hear about so-and-so? 
You know what ends up happening in that over time? It can cause a, a severing of friendships. So look back at verse 27 and notice now, in there it's an ungodly man. He digs up evil. We looked at that and we talked about that fact. He digs up evil and the things he does. Ungodly people love to bring up the bad. But now you've got this forward person that perverse. Gossips cause strife. Wasn't that a simple situation? Isn't that a simple scenario? Gossips cause strife. You know what happens? We start sharing around something that we know, and before we know it, we've caused dissension, we've caused difficulty. A froward man soweth strife, and a whisperer separateth chief friends. Now, I know these last two, they kind of, they, they're a little bit on that negative, but I think it's a great teaching situation for us. Have you ever known in a real life situation who someone, because they couldn't keep their mouth shut, they ended up causing a problem, causing a rift, causing strife between two people, hurting someone, causing friendships to be broken? That's what happens. Gossip causes strife. That's what he gives us here. Now, in light of that, what can we do? I wrote down three commitments that I want us to give. One has a little few couple of thoughts under it I want to give those to you when I look at Proverbs to me those are practical verses those are good reminders those are things that could help this world and help in our real life situations if we would remember those guidelines number one the first commitment I thought that might be good when I looked at this passage number one I will seek to be a person of compassion and truth when dealing with wrong you want to know what commitment we ought to make if we're going to be the right kind of Christian we need to seek to be a person of compassion and truth when dealing with wrong never forsake truth but you can do it with a compassionate heart I will seek to be a person of compassion and truth when I have to deal with something whether it's where I'm dealing with a child, whether it's where I'm dealing with a family member, whether I'm dealing with a situation at work, whatever it is, I want to be a person who's known of, for compassion and truth. I will seek to be a person of compassion and truth. Will you make that commitment? Number two, the second one is this. I will seek God's wisdom to deal with situations to bring about the best outcome. I will seek God's wisdom to deal with situations to bring about the best outcome. Can I remind you, whenever you study when things are dealt with in the Scripture, the goal is always reconciliation. When God dealt with Adam and Eve, and all the way back in the garden, when they had sinned and done wrong, when God came, you know what his goal was? To see them brought back into fellowship, and he did what was necessary for that. The cross is a message of reconciliation. He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. The goal should always be to bring the best outcome out of whatever situations we deal with. Not all situations are good. Not all situations are easy. Not all situations are even going to come out ideal, but we ought to seek to bring the best outcome. But to do that, we must have God's wisdom. We need to pray for that. We need to ask for that. Number three, the third commitment that I wrote down as I looked at these verses and was kind of thinking them toward tonight, I will guard my tongue by the principles of Ephesians 4.29. I was in a conversation just yesterday when that, that passage came up. But the, the principles of Ephesians 4.29. 29. Let me read to you what it says. This verse I've shared before, and I think it's a great verse for us to remember when we're, when we're having to deal with things in that. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, just say I missed it by a book. In Ephesians 4, 29, the verse starts with a negative part. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. So that's a, that's a 
the thing that says, don't do this. But then he gives, what are the guidelines of how I should determine what I have and what I share? Number one, is what I am about to say good? Is what I'm about to say good? You know, it's a funny thing. Sometimes in the day of social media, there's so many knee-jerk reactions that I think compassion and truth has gone out the window. But sometimes I think it's also we get so caught up and things are being fired out there at such a rate that sometimes we don't take time to send it through the filter of the heart. We don't take time to send it through the filter of prayer. And things can be thrown out there. Sometimes before you say something, sometimes it's good to say, hey, is what I'm about to say good? Is it good? By the way, sometimes even if it's good, you don't have to share it. My wife and I were talking recently and we had heard some news from, from some friends of ours and uh, we were kind of talking about it and it was, uh, it was some good news. It was even good news. And we were talking about it and my wife said this, this, said, said this to me. She said, you know what? It's not my story to tell. It's not my story to tell. In other words, even though it's good news, I don't have to be the one to spread it. Why don't I let that person be the one to spread it? Let them be able to share the good news. Let other people be able to rejoice with them. Even, be, even when it's good, don't always feel like you have to be the first one to post it on social media or put it on Facebook or put it on Instagram. Sometimes, even if it's good, hey, wait on it. Let somebody else have the chance to share their story. But she said, it's not my story to tell. Isn't that wise? Before I began to say things, number one, I asked myself the question, is what I'm about to say, is it good? Is it good? It goes on to say, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. The second question is, what I'm about to say, will it build up the person I am speaking to and the person I'm speaking about? Will it, will it build up the person I'm speaking to? Will it edify them? Will it build them up? It will build up them? Will it build up the person we're talking about? Boy, that'll stop a lot of conversation, won't it? Will it build up that person? Will it help to build up the person I'm talking about? First question is what I'm about to say good. Will it build up the person I'm speaking to and the person I'm speaking about? The third question is this. Will it minister grace? Will my conversation minister grace? Is there going to be a grace that's going to come if I bring this element, this news, this information into this conversation? Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. mouth. But that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearer. You see, we are told and given so many different areas of information that are practical and practical for life. And we hear those things in, in the book of Proverbs. And when you begin to look at those principal verses and you take those principles and you bring them into real life situation, you know what begins to happen? You begin to find that God's word is relevant. God's word is helpful. God's word teaches me. And as it does, it helps to make me more like Christ. Make those commitments. Make, th make those commitments. I will seek to be a person of compassion and truth when dealing with wrong. I will seek God's wisdom to deal with situations to bring about the best outcome. I will guard my tongue by the principles of Ephesians 4.29 by asking those questions. You know what will happen? It will help you in real life situations. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the evening. Thank you for the time that we've had Lord, help us to take your word and apply it to our lives. May it be a part of how we treat one another in our family. May it be a part of how we conduct ourselves in our work life. May it be that which will show us to be people of integrity 
and people of Christ likeness and through that may the testimony of Christ go forward we'll thank you for it we ask this in Jesus name Amen